Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Chingo Chats. I am your host, Chingo Bling. We got producer Rob in the building. Hello, everybody. We just knocked out an episode of RPT, Red Pill Tamales. If you have not subscribed to that RSS feed, go get you some of that good Red Pill Masa Talk. And I uh, realized I didn't really give you a proper introduction on RPT. You know, it's all we right. We came in hot. We came in super fucking hot. It's all right. Straight to it. Ain't no time. We ain't got time to play today. We came in super hot, and I just skipped over it, and I just went straight to $30 million on crack pipes. <laughs> uh, I'm a stand-up comedian, and I can't wait to hit the road, see your beautiful faces, shake hands, kiss the babies. It's going to be a good old time on the Legalized Freedom Tour. Raleigh, North Carolina, first stop February 27th. McAllen, Texas, March 5th. Naples, Florida, March 16th through the 17th. West Palm Beach, Florida, April 3rd. Tacoma, Washington, April 7th. Nashville, Tennessee, April 14th. Sounds like the lawn, <laughs> the lawn crew is here. I don't think we need a whole bunch of lawn. It should be pretty care. quick. Also, mm -hmm. I can't believe that this happened. Like, it, we don't plan this. We actually try to plan around it. And inevitably, even when you try to move the time of a guy, they're usually here right when we record. Well, I guess they come Thursdays. Yeah, they do. And we're on here in a Thursday. So just go to chingoblin.com, get your tickets now. Nashville, Corpus Christi, Arlington, New Braunfels, Abilene, Lubbock, San Angelo, Odessa, Austin, Texas, Albuquerque, El Paso, Irvine, Ontario, Denver, Colorado, Oklahoma City, Chi-Town, Chicago, Phoenix, San Jose, Brea, Oxnard, San Antonio, Addison, and of course, Houston, Texas. We'll announce that one real soon. Whole bunch of those ticket links, like 99% of those ticket links are live on chingoblin.com where you can also join the Patreon there's a link there for that. You, there's links for everything. You could join the newsletter. Everything. It's revamped. There's buttons. It's super simple. Just follow the flow of where you want to go. Podcast, Discord, Patreon, merch, by there's, the way. There's a vlog section. And there's a members area. Yeah, so it's a new members area. It's free. All right, you just create an account, give us your email, and you have access to all the new vlogs and behind the scenes we drop every Friday. Every, fr every Friday. Every Viernes. <laughs> you want to show that hat? like that hat oh this yeah, is yeah one of the many things on the website yeah we, we got some new merch coming uh legalized freedom we got hoodies t-shirts caps the whole shebang even some beanies i know you i got some the, they're getting made i gotta call and check up on them nice what color are the beanies black your headphones good yeah it's just a little sensitive every time i move yeah we're good um oh you said they're black what, uh, are they like that or, or are they yeah it's gonna have um yeah it's gonna have that nice mm-hmm Yes, sir. So, so enjoy the sounds of the long crew. Yeah, for a few minutes. Uh, so I had brought it before we started recording that Spotify's um, had made a statement, right? So I wanted to read this for you. It's from Reuters. Chief Content Officer Don Ostroff told advertisers at a conference Wednesday that backlash around popular U.S. podcaster Joe Rogan has been a, quote, real learning experience for the streaming service. They always say that. This is a learning moment. Every struggle session has to include that. This is, this is a learning moment for me. We, this is a quote, quote, we do feel that we have the responsibility to support creator expression, but also balance that creator expression with safety for users and our advertisers, end quote, said Ostroff. Before I even keep reading there, what, I mean, what responsibility do you think they have when it comes to somebody choosing what they're going to listen to? Um, what actual responsibility do they have? I mean, what responsibility does Spotify have when it comes to me choosing what shows I listen to? I don't know how to answer that, bro. Because they don't have any responsibility. Yeah. Like, that's a made up phrase. Like, yeah. what are you talking about? I think, um, obviously, with everything that's going on, you know, the regime and the powers that be, the globalists, the elites, the CCP, it's in their best, it's in their best interest to bundle up things like dr peter mccullough alex jones dr robert malone like i mean different people shit <laughs> whether it's i don't know matt taibbi i mean there's different things that different people say yeah and i mean I, first of all thank you joe rogan i appreciate joe rogan for the format of his show uh i feel like he contributes a lot the fact that his um listenership is so much bigger than the mainstream media is probably the only thing that's given us hope right now. So Don Ostroff, who has been a key driver in Spotify's work to turn the platform into a top podcast hub, said speaking at an interactive advertising bureau annual conference in New York, which is part of the problem, unfortunately, is that these advertising platforms or these platforms that are basically advertising platforms have these people that they have to try to appease, right? They're, they're worried about their ESG Cisco score. and all that stuff. And it's it, 
I always thought, and I not always thought, I thought for a long time that Spotify wouldn't outshine Apple for a long time. And it seems like they are kind of starting to do that with their reach and their investing in shows. And they're really trying to focus on the podcasting world for Spotify as a platform. But shit like this, I think, is actually kind of detrimental in the long run for them. Yeah, what happens is they start to, for one, you got all these woke employees, right? Anytime you're a tech company, you get these people straight out of college. They just got indoctrinated. Uh, a lot of liberal progressive stuff sounds nice. So those values start to permeate the corporation and it changes the company culture. And then you have a small fringe minority of people that are super woke Marxists that believe that uh, a white man with a microphone is our biggest threat. Not, not the CCP, our actual existential threat. They worried about the white man with a microphone and some headphones. That's what they worried about. I want, to, I want to stay on the subject for a bit because it's fascinating to me because it involves, you know, big power structures, uh, music, industry, big conglomerates like this. There was this article that was uh, blame cheap music for Joe Rogan being on Spotify. Cheap music? Yeah. A growing number of artists are pulling their music from Spotify to protest its business relationship with Joe Rogan. Some subscribers have started to jump ship. And among Spotify staff, there's growing discontent, as The Verge reported on Thursday. Despite all of this, there's no indication of Spotify changing its tune, which they shouldn't. The Verge is reporting that Daniel uh, Eek uh, defended the Rogan deal in a company town hall, calling it critical to Spotify's success, which I totally agree. Uh, I mean, it just goes on to make a case that uh, it's not entirely wrong. Amazon Music, Apple Music, and YouTube Music all carry more or less the same music catalog as Spotify's, and the music industry has largely given up on exclusive album deals. In the context, exclusive podcasts can be a key uh, differentiator. How do you feel about that? Here's another thing, bro. Average Joe Rogan podcast is three hours. Yeah. In order for Spotify to hold your attention for three hours using music, it's probably going to be over three albums. A lot, of, a lot of times albums, it could be 12 tracks, 10 tracks, whatever. It might come out to 40 minutes, 45 minutes, a whole album. That is a simple point that I didn't even think of off the bat. Which it, it, takes, it takes an artist a long time to make an album that you want to listen to in its entirety. Now, for that artist or even a handful of artists to make three hours worth of material that you want to sit and be a captive audience member, that's a lot of resources, studio time, producers, paperwork, back and forth, signatures, you know, songwriters. There's a whole, there's a whole shit, shit ton of stuff. You go, you got to shoot a music video. You got to promote it. You got to get the word out. You got to build your fan base. Now they're checking for you. Now they're going to go listen to your music. Rogan just sits and talks with somebody for three hours. Quote, Spotify has to pander to podcasters more than it does artists. Like a podcaster isn't an artist? But anyway, said media research analyst Mark Mulligan. To maintain an exclusive distribution deal with one of the most popular podcasters in the world apparently requires a lot of pandering. What pandering? I mean, I, it's almost like they're framing it as he's an inferior product. Uh, JR, yeah, that's it's, exactly it's almost they're like they're framing it as like JRE is... um. Is it's almost like, it's almost as if the songs are your hearty meat and potatoes, and this Joe Rogan is like GMO sugar candy <laughs> fluff. Okay, and it's like, actually, don't frame it that way. Don't frame it as people have to be pandered to, like rules, like ethics have to be bent. It's like, what's so wrong? The problem is, it's exposing the narrative. Like the government is trying to say, we're doing our best. We're doing a good job. We're handling it. Uh, this is all for your safety. Go along with it. Go along with it. And then here comes a man who interviews scientists and journalists and experts and, and all kinds of people, even comedians, interviews all kinds of people. All of a sudden, they want to they wanna Alex Jones him. And if you go back and watch old episodes of uh, Rogan with Alex Jones, or or stuff like that and he's on there saying stuff like well you know i mean this is why they want to deplatform you alex you 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 talk so fast and we don't have a chance to like fact check you or whatever right you say some wacky stuff and i think i think alex even said like dude wait till they start coming for you type of thing so left unsaid during this leaked town hall was another aspect of this relationship spotify is in bed with joe rogan because streaming music is too damn cheap Okay, so in other words, Les Conviene, like it's a viable product. It has a huge 
audience. Right. If anything, he licensed his stuff to y'all too cheap. Right. A hundred percent, considering how much money they've lost year after year. So music services have long struggled to pay those huge royalty checks. Their contracts with the music uh, rights holders are calling for. Some have even argued that the deck is fundamentally stacked against the streaming media industry and that music subscription services cannot be profit, can never be profitable. I don't know if you have any take on that. Well, I mean, they're giving the, they're bird feeding the artists. How is it that they don't have the upper hand? How does, how does Spotify and Apple music, the people that are collecting subscriptions, these are tech companies that have monopolized the distribution of music and they're bird feeding the artist. The artist gets like a sliver of a penny. It's like, you got to get a million streams. You know what I'm saying? You got to, you got to have a deep catalog and a cult following. Spotify has lost billions of dollars over the years, a streak that continued into 2021. For the full year, the company booked net losses of $38.8 million on $11 billion in revenue, according to the latest earnings report released yesterday. Yeah, I think the way they try to offset that is they say, sure, we're in the red on paper. However, we're growing. It's like our intrinsic value is strong because we have more users. Like that's always been like Twitter and Facebook's philosophy, they might be like, well, on the books, you know, we're not making a lot of money, mm -hmm. but look at how much growth, look at how many new subscribers, look at how many uh, users we have. Uh, they also go on to make the argument that, uh, and the big reason why Spotify isn't generating profits is because music subscriptions haven't changed in 20 years. Is that true? Say that one more time. The reason that they're losing, that they're not generating profits is because the price of the music subscriptions haven't changed in 20 years. They had music subscriptions 20 years ago? They said, you read this right. When streaming music pioneer Rhapsody, now known as Napster. Is that right? Is Rhapsody known as Napster? Or is it the other way around? I don't know, bro. Either way, uh, first began offering unlimited streaming access to major labels catalogs in 2002. It priced the subscription bundle at $10. Fast forward to 2022, the Spotify, Spotify still charges $10 per month. The price of Netflix mid-tier mid subscription went from eight to fifteen fifty during the same time, and everything else has become more expensive too. Adjusted for inflation, ten dollars in twenty in two thousand two is equivalent to fifteen fifty today. Yeah, maybe. So, yeah. I mean, if the argument is we need to pay musicians more money, I'm not against that. But if if the argument is that they shouldn't be in bed with Joe Rogan because it's making them the money, money that they're losing on the music deals that they're making, I mean, that's just like that's a non-correlative yeah, argument. It's weird. And the artists don't have no goddamn leverage because we all keep fucking with these companies. That's what I wanted so to get into. We don't have no leverage. So like, how, how does how does the artist win here, really? So for first, let me explain this. You have a thing called the RIAA, the Recording Industry Alliance of America, which is basically the the law enforcement arm of the record business. These are the goons. So back in um back in the day when Texas had a lot of record stores. And independent artists were making money and getting their name out by making mixtapes and freestyling over other people's beats. They were getting into the record stores. They were getting into the mom and pops. The mom and pop was able to pay their rent off of Chameleon Air, Slim Thug, Chingo Bling, Lucky. Like all these people that were out the trunk cranking out mixtapes consistently. Swisher House, so on. And the RIAA would go in and police these things. Right. They'd catch bootleggers like if somebody at the flea market is making copies of uh, U2, the Sting, the mm -hmm. police, uh, DMX, whoever. They'd go lock them up, you know, throw the book at them. Uh, they went after DJ Drama, who had a big mixtape empire in the underground. And uh, they hit him with charges. He got thrown in jail. It, it was a chilling effect. It scared everybody that was in that game, <laughs> including us. And um, so basically the RIAA. And the record business, they basically went and did these deals um, using us, the artists, the musician, as a commodity, using our art as a commodity. So it was up to them to phase out the CD. It was up to them to phase out vinyl. You know, obviously new technology is coming about. And they saw what file sharing was doing. So the reason Napster was able to go legit and partner up or uh, turn into Rhapsody or what have you is because there was a P.O. box address and there was a name, there was a person that was centralized. Like they knew they could find the man and sue him. I forget his name. He helped create, um, I think he was an investor in Facebook in the movie uh, with Mark Zuckerberg with uh, Justin Timberlake. Mm -hmm. Justin Timberlake's character was the guy who created Napster. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I forget his name. Shit. I forgot. Yeah. 
So he obviously was a tech nerd, file sharing type of guy, very powerful because he set up this file sharing uh, exchange system, right? Which arguably cheapened music and musicians art. It helped me because it helped me get known. Like all of a sudden the kid- Sean of, Parker. Sean Parker. So all of a sudden, thanks to FrostWire, LimeWire, and other file sharing sites, kids were downloading 50 Cent, Soulja Boy, Chingo Bling, like just for free, just to exchange or whatever. John Mayer. Yeah, John Mayer. And, uh, but then it's almost like, it's not that he sold out, but they basically are like, we're going to sue you into oblivion or you're going to join us. A lot of these other file sharing companies didn't have a PO box. They didn't have uh, LLC. They didn't have their name on file. So it was like a... Um, it was like a starfish instead of a spider. Mm. Napster mm. was a spider. They're able to chop off the head and, and kill it or coerce it. Uh, Frostwire, LimeWire, these other ones were decentralized. It was just servers and there's like no face to it. There's no P.O. box. To it was a Bitcoin of servers. Yeah, yeah, it was decentralized. It was a starfish. So you'd go and try to chop off a limb and it would turn into two other more file sharing sites. Interesting. So, uh, so it goes on to say, I just find this really interesting. Uh, Netflix produces. So, why can't Spotify raise its prices like Netflix did? Turns out that comparing those two isn't even like comparing apples to oranges. Uh, it's more like adding meat to a fruit salad. <sighs> Netflix produces shows and movies you won't find anywhere else, as mentioned before. Spotify streams the same music as Apple, Amazon, and YouTube. They're prisoners. Uh, there's a prisoner's dilemma dynamic at play because of the lack of differentiation between the two streaming services, Mulligan said. Uh, if one increases its pricing, it'll simply go to the less expensive version, right? That kind of makes sense, obviously. Uh, in other words, if Spotify raises to 15, people will just go to Apple's $10 plan. And unlike Spotify, the other guys can afford to lose money because they'll just make it up on the other ends like iPhones, Prime subscriptions, etc. So they have been forced to get creative. The company has tried many other things over the years to make more money. So I guess that's where they get into the podcasting shift. So I'll say this. Spotify knew what they were getting when they hired Joe Rogan. When they hired Joe Rogan, it was a tool. It was a strategy. Basically, you're able to go listen on Spotify to JRE for free, right? Mm -hmm. am, I, am I not mistaken? Yeah, you don't need to pay the subscription. So basically, they licensed his catalog with the exception of a few episodes, right? I think they've deleted up to 100 now. Mm -hmm. So they gave him what? Uh, I think people speculate 150 million, 200 million, 100 mm -hmm. million, whatever. They gave him a bag to say, you're going to be exclusive to us so that we could bring more ears and eyeballs to our platform in hopes that it will translate into those people staying on the platform longer, creating an account, and being paying subscribers. That way, they can justify to their share shareholders and their board of committees and their chairman and all these other people. Everybody gets a fucking raise because the plan worked. So uh, their creativity included a short-lived foray into video, which I don't know that they've really even rolled out, and attempts to strike direct distribution deals with artists uh, to cut labels out of the equation. After major labels and distributors pushed back against the effort, Spotify uh, settled on its current strategy, which is what they do now. And became the biggest player, uh, and then to become the biggest player in podcasting. And not to mention, they're getting into hardware. Right, the the, the car thing, Spotify car thing. So, so they're up against steep competition. They're having to be creative and innovative when it comes to, like, how do we immerse ourselves? How do we make it a different experience for the user while they're in their cars? You know what I'm saying? So, so in reality, they're spread thin. They're, they're getting into a lot of different things. And this notion that somehow Joe Rogan is um, a liability. Um, they're trying to equate Joe Rogan's massive listenership as something that's like QAnon. Right? I, dude, absolutely. So <laughs> two, two, point, two more points here. Uh, they so mad that he got so many listeners. So by shifting listeners to podcasts, Spotify aims to reduce the revenue share it has to fork over to rights holders, which would make sense. I'm like, hey, fuck, you know, Neil Young and all these people, take your shit. We're, we're not wanting to cut these royalty checks anyway. Which he did a deal with BlackRock, Blackstone anyway. Right. So he was more just a, a, a puppet. And they're tied into Pfizer. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy enough. And he don't know his masters. Fuck him. Exclusive deals like the one that they gave Joe Rogan is uh, also come with the promise of a Netflix type of business model. Instead of paying for every stream, the company simply writes a big check once and watches those subscriber dollars roll in so that i mean i never really dissected what the move was or why they made such a push to to go after apple like the king of podcasts like if it wasn't for apple 
it wouldn't, I don't know the podcasting it would have ever gotten as big as it did as quickly as it did because that directory was so simple. It was easy to access. It was already on the iPhone, so on and so forth. But they've really become a wrench in the podcasting game. And when you kind of read this guy's analysis of it, not that I agree with all of it, but um, that part is pretty interesting. How many Latinos, I wonder, if we could find that statistic? Like, Not a lot. How many Latinos listen to podcasts? Not a lot. Now, we've gone over this before. So we're, you and I, we're and a handful of others, it's almost like... Trailblazers, man. Yeah, fucking trailblazers. Yeah, yes. yeah, it's like the tip of the spear, the fucking trailblazer. Literally, that's the best word for it. Like we're blazing a trail, and uh, and God willing, you know, around twenty twenty four and beyond. Yeah. Well, um, when you think of Rogan going from forty years old to fifty year old, fifty years old, what his podcast was able to do. Imagine what you are able to do from forty to fifty. What do you mean forty to fifty? Oh, his age. Yeah, his age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely a really cool medium. Uh, if you guys want to sponsor, <laughs> yeah. e- email redpiltamales at gmail.com. Uh, but until then, big shout out to the subscribers, man. Yeah. Y'all make it all possible. Sharing the clips, uh, making clips, sharing the links, subscribing to the YouTube, and so on. Yeah, you guys will always come first, obviously. For sure. Um, so in that same conversation, I don't know, they, they go on to talk about a lot more, but what... Uh, did we get back to when you were describing the who are the goons of the industry? The R. Oh yeah, the RIAA. RIAA. So are those are the people behind the labels? Like those are the people that protect their best interests? Yes, it's the Recording Industry Alliance of America. So it's probably like a combination of lawyers, uh, big budget, basically like keeping competition at bay. Not to mention, if you really want to go a deep dive, or I guess smart artists at bay too. Then, huh? Yes, like um, even just. I mean, you had um, the hip hop police in New York, which was like big in the 90s, where they were infiltrating, setting up, you know, rap crews, um, you know, stirring up beef. I mean, the East Coast, West Coast thing was arguably, you know, the media poured a lot of flame on that. So all the times you have rappers coming up dead, rappers going to jail. Who wins? The upper executives who don't have any of these concerns, like... All they worry about is stock price and who they're going to sign next. But anytime you got a, ra- a little Pookie in them, shot little Ray Ray in them, you know what I'm saying? Or <laughs> or, or a little Dirt held up some money yeah. and put a very <clears throat> cryptic caption out there like, I'm, uh, I'm only going to pay you for the bodies that I asked for, not the ones that got hit and stuff like that. And it's like, y'all promoting putting hits on each other in the hood, like... The whole purpose of of getting money is to buy freedom. Yeah. That's the whole purpose of getting in the rap game and getting money is so that you can get away from the problems, uh, create generational wealth, get some real estate for your kids, like make sure your grandkids are good, make sure your kids go to private school. Now I got a hit on Lil Ray Ray. You know, uh, Takashi 6 9 told me I got a 30-pack on his head. And it's like, what are y'all doing? Just talking about this and reading this makes me think that maybe here's just a strategy that I, I randomly thought of just now is if 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 they wanted to go more of this like Netflix type of exclusive content, you know, Netflix produces shows, they have their own original series, and that's why they're able to, you know, uh, basically be, be the only real main players in the game for a, for a large portion of the streaming industry, like show wise. If let's just say you're the artist on Spotify and they're like, all right, we're going to test this pilot idea where you're working on the Versace Mariachi album. Let's take it back a year and a half ago. We're going to cut you an exclusive deal if you can also provide us along with that, the make, basically like the making of that album, like a vlog, like a documentary of the making of that so that we could put it as a part of the new video series, the video option that's also coming out to Spotify. So subscribers will get your album and we'll get the documentary of the making of the album and then they're they can't get it anywhere else. they can't go to apple and they can't go to youtube for yeah that. hbo is not going to come and make the documentary <clears throat> of right. your life right that's very smart they should uh they should absolutely do that hit me up spotify yeah that was that was i mean that's very smart uh and it sounds like it'd be a great opportunity for an artist especially if they like sponsor the tour yeah because you're already going to be making the album and most people already record a bunch of stuff anyway and there's good examples of like fan made documentaries. I always reference the John Mayer one, but there's other ones where if you're gonna do that, cut me an exclusive deal, get the album in, and get the documentary. And that would give artists the option of not being enslaved by the record companies. Right. Um, Is that ever? Do you think not gonna be a thing? Well, for one, they have the artists too busy um, competing with each other instead of comparing notes. One of the few conversations I had with my favorite rapper, Pimp C, the Goat. 
was basically saying like he was saying the labels don't want us to exchange notes because word was getting around that I, I own my master's that asylum gave me my masters they agreed they said yes to something that no other label would give me i had creative control so on and so forth so the word was getting out like why the fuck how's he getting all his shit he, we're not even supposed to take him serious and he's the only one getting the master p deal how did they let him keep 70 percent, and they're only getting a distribution fee at 30 percent um so this idea of like artists dealing exclusive I know that um, well, Jay-Z did a couple interesting deals with like the Sprint title type of thing. And then um, Future, I don't know the details of his thing, but Future did like an exclusive thing with Apple. There's been a handful. I think, <clears throat> I don't know what Drake did. I know Future did a couple things like that. And considering we're, that we're talking about them getting big into the podcast game, another way to maybe even uh, reframe the documentary along with your album would be start a studio sessions podcast. You're already recording the, the podcast. Now it would get artists that aren't making podcasts into the podcasting game. So you would make uh, a, a series like studio sessions, like the Versace Mariachi studio sessions, and you do a podcast along your, your route of making the album. Almost like a director's cut. Almost commentary. like a director's cut, yeah. And then when the album's done, it's released, then you've got the time in between the next album that you're just now creating content for that platform exclusively. Dude, some of these artists these days, they're they're tied in with horrible, horrible contracts, like 360 deals where. The label gets a cut off your merch. They get a cut off your tour. They get a cut. They they become like these um boutique agencies where they're just oh we're gonna get you a deal with Popeyes or Sprite and all that's cool because you get your cut they get theirs, but they literally have their hand in every aspect of your pocket, and you wouldn't be able to, um to my knowledge, do a deal with Spotify where it's like all right I'm gonna give you I'm just gonna let you um. I'm going to license this project to you. You can put the video documentary on your shit. And, and at the end of the day, it, it all reverts back to me after a certain time or whatever. And I'm sure Spotify won't care because they're not like in the business of owning music album masters. They're in the business of selling subscriptions, having a good um, price on the stock market. The shareholders are happy and then being innovative on the tech side. Dude, the fact, I mean, honestly, I'm not trying to toot my own horn. That's a genius idea for artists to be doing because one of the examples I can think of was uh, Morgan Wallen recently came out with that song Flower Shops with a country artist named Ernest. And Ernest has a podcast on his YouTube channel as well called Just Being Ernest. And uh, one of the recent episodes where he had Morgan on, they were talking about like that morning, they had to go, per they had to go perform uh, Flower Shops at a radio station, right? And then they did that. And then they came back to the studio, did the podcast and talking about all that. They're on the road together. And I'm like, if this was exclusive to Spotify, you would have so much leverage, so much power, so much money, such a big uh, opportunity to create a deal with them because they're getting my show, my doc, and the music on Spotify only. Yep. Instead of having it on YouTube, and then you put it on Apple, and then you put it on Prime, do the Joe Rogan deal, but combine everything. Yep. Yep. Hmm. Absolutely. So that would, yeah, that would be great. What can Spotify do? Uh, it's unlikely that Spotify would uh, abandon the ten dollars price tag without industry wide support because you're right they would just go to cheaper alternatives however mulligan thinks that it's uh it'll it, they can still tweak some of the new some of the knobs to make music streaming more profitable for everyone involved labels and artists included period there right L like you're just describing could you ever really see a world where the label will allow the artist to get paid the same as them or on the on an equal level playing field like does that make sense would they want that i mean there's a lot of artists who who are very independent they keep um, the powers that be like this day and age. You're able to deal direct with your fans. You know what I'm saying? You could do a box bundle kit, you know, 20 year anniversary of this album. And we're going to re-release this on vinyl. And this one comes with the shirt and the documentaries on my YouTube. Uh, go to my SoundCloud. Like these days, you're able to like Currency. I don't know. There's an artist named Currency, but I don't know. Um. Like, if he's tied into anybody, he seems pretty independent. He seems pretty free. He's able to just crank out, like, a new album every month. And he collects his, uh, his royalties and his mechanicals from all the streams. And, you know, he seems pretty happy and successful and not having to deal with headaches. Yeah. Um, and on subject, off subject, <clears throat> we got hit up to where um, basically like a casting audition opportunity for um, 
a DC Comics movie mm -hmm. where I'd be up for the role to play the uncle or the lead. And it's like the first Latino superhero. I, I can't say too, too much, but it's like the first Latino superhero. The role that I will be trying out for, which I'm probably not going to do it, it'd be the uh, a strong supporting role, a comedic type of character, and it'd be his uncle. Now, why would I not want to do something like that? Well, for one, I'm very vocal about my political views. So am, would I be wasting my time? <laughs> right. Would I be wasting my time? You really think... The leftists that control Hollywood and everything else, they're going to be like totally OK with uh, Chingo Bling stealing the show, you know, getting people, have people laughing in theaters, um, you know, so and so forth. So here are some of the dilemmas that I face. Well, for one, you know, I have a tour coming up. Um, I, I, we have a podcast. How disruptive would a movie shoot from April to July in Atlanta and Puerto Rico be. God damn. April, May, June, July in Atlanta and Puerto Rico. So am I bringing my nanny? Am I bringing the kids, my wife? Like, are we all going to Atlanta and Puerto Rico? How much you paying me to where I'm going to have to zoom in on my podcast from now? I'm going to have to cancel a lot of tour dates. So if you have not gotten your tickets. Yeah. Get them now, chingobling.com. Because if y'all don't get them now, I'm going to go over here and chase Hollywood and be woke. <laughs> I'm going to let them re-edit the ending for the Chinese <laughs> audience. Because I'm literally, I'm telling them no. Uh, honestly, here's, here's verbatim okay. my response. Honestly, since I'm so vocal about my political views, they may shy away from someone like me. And it's like, well, part of the casting team, Chingo, are Latinas and they know who you are. They just need comedic talent, preferably Mexican-American. So if you want to do it, I'll get you in. Think it's a great opportunity. I said April through July is a big commitment. When is the deadline for this uh, uh, audition? You got to turn it in Friday at 5 p.m., but I can push it to Monday morning if you need more time. Okay. Um, so, yeah, they go on and on to kind of, like, give more context. As for compensation, if you did get the role... We would certainly aggressively negotiate that. I would strongly suggest bringing on a powerful entertainment lawyer, yada, 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 so you could deal with Warner Brothers business affairs. Oof. Do I want all those headaches right now? Red Pill Tamales, uh, patreon.com forward slash Red Pill Tamales. I have a lot of faith in the podcasting art form. Um, I get to crank out some more music. I get to go on tour, be in front of you guys, be myself. Because I look at people like Joe Rogan and Burt Kreischer and Tom Segura and, and Brendan Schaub and all these people who don't got to go be thirsty and, and contort themselves into this audition. And you it's I don't know if it's a cattle call. I don't know if I'm going up against 50 other people or they're just going to give it to Michael Pena. <laughs> You're probably right. But, you know, he is a sci he's Scientologist and he's got to deal with Disney, I believe. So they put him in all the Ant-Mans and all that shit. So maybe they need the counterpart. DC Comics, what type of shit y'all on? Holla at me. Holla at me. Let me know. DC's Marvel. I, I, I just need it to be a, a, if, a sure thing. Yeah. Like if they said, Chingo, this role is written specifically with you in mind. It's between you and two other motherfuckers. Turn that shit in. We're going to make it worth your time. You might have to cancel a bunch of tour dates. You're going to be in Atlanta and Puerto Rico. And you're going to have to zoom in with Rob to podcast. Unless Rob's coming to Puerto Rico. Hey. You know what I'm saying? What's up? So, uh, Rob gonna bring the whole family. Yeah, for sure, right? All right, kids, we're going to Puerto Rico. Yeah. <laughs> Lavense las manos. That's all they'll be saying. Yeah. Lavense las manos. Well, first off, Ant Man is Marvel. It's not DC. Yeah. Yeah. Ant Man is Marvel. That's what I said. You said DC. No, I said the movie I'm gonna be in. Oh, okay, I was okay, auditioning okay. for is DC. Okay, gotcha. And if they need a counterpart to offset Michael Pena in Ant Man. Gotcha. That's funny. Speaking of Ant Man, uh, uh, Evangeline Lilly, she plays um, Ant Man's counterpart in Ant Man vs. Wasp. She's basically Wasp, I believe. Um, she came out very, not very, she made statements about anti jab stuff. So she's been in hot water. But at the same time, nothing like I've seen uh, you know, Gina Carano go through or any of these other people. So it's, it's interesting to see that. I mean, are we, are we not allowed to say that the jab isn't working as well as we would have liked? I mean, is that so fucking controversial? Uh, it's, it seems like. From two weeks ago, it's not. But prior to like a month ago, it was super controversial because the science is changing, Jingo. All the right? science is changing. So now CNN is saying like, well, you know. I have uh, I've been seeing a lot less of Fauci as well, which is a little odd. Don't you think? 
yeah, I don't know. I don't know what their strategy is, but uh, that's an RPT combo, Rob. You're right, man. You're right. I just had to bring that up because you um, brought up Ant Man. I know. Way in tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. So this is Thursday. We're recording the uh, the Patreon episode on Thursday. It comes out Monday. But tomorrow, how are you feeling about it? How's this um, week been? Week week uh, five, I believe. Next week's yeah. our last week. So uh, Jiu Jitsu on Tuesday, two days ago. Um, I didn't roll as hard or as long. Maybe because um. I'm doing better at treading water and surviving, meaning like I'm not just like, I don't know, maybe I'm not holding my breath and straining or, or whatever, right? I just don't seem to be as sweaty. Mm-hmm. Or maybe I didn't wear as many like layers or something. But um, I did your cardio method yesterday. Nice. So that that was good. Very effective. It's also a good like active rest activity too. Like in between, like if it's uh, not like a hard day for you, but you want to get some movement in, that's like a really good 30-minute session to get in. Yeah, like if you're not hitting the weights that day. Yeah. You should at least do that. Right. So uh, I'm feeling okay. I started getting the MyFitness app, MyFitnessPal, back on my phone just so I could start weighing and measuring and eyeballing and actually plugging it in. Like, nice. how, how many calories were those two spicy Chick-fil-A right. uh, chicken breasts? You know, 600 so calories. Good. Yeah, very good. Sauce or no sauce? I put a little bit of sauce. Yeah. Chick-fil-A sauce or barbecue? Uh, I actually tried the Polynesian. You act like there's only two options, bro. That is a, there is only two options. Did you Have you tried the spicy Polynesian? No. Okay. We'll see I mean, that. I've tried it, but it just it tastes like mustard to me. Mustard? Yeah. There's nothing mustardy about it. It's spicy sweet. Mm. It, it, it tastes like honey sriracha with, with red pepper flakes. I have to try it again then. Okay. I'll take your word for it. Keep an open mind. So what did you say? Chick-fil-A sauce or which one? Barbecue. Honey they're, roasted barbecue? Uh, Whatever their barbecue sauce. Is it honey roasted? Maybe, like maybe their barbecue, barbecue sauce. Oh, the only one that I've gets kind of like in a longer-ish package. It's very good. Okay. Well, they have a variety of options if y'all want to live on the edge. <laughs> a stray out of the standard. Fuck that. Live inside my little bubble. Um, uh, We got the UFC coming up this weekend. Let's talk about this. You want to do a fighter's companion, but I t- I'm not available this weekend. Yeah. So what are you going to do? Well, I'm... I started picking Frank's brain like, hey, dude, we didn't really get into it because we started editing a special that um, I'm going to call it a special. But it, it's it's some stand up comedy that I had filmed and we want to release it finally. Half hour, hour, 20 minutes. Nice. Yeah, 20 minutes. Only because uh, the death joke, we already did it for uh, HBO. The birth joke, we uh, we did it for uh, just the bit. Adam Taylor's project. It's a sketch type of thing. And then some other jokes kind of like were just either not as strong or just dated. Like I had a joke that was about being on Netflix and not having a Netflix account. I'm like, I'm not even on Netflix anymore. Their license expired. But uh, anyway, uh, fighter fighter companion. It's going to be a hell of a fight this weekend. Yeah. Adesanya. It's going down in Houston. Mm-hmm. Uh, Whitaker versus Adesanya. What is that? It's part two or part three? Two. This is part two. It's yeah, a rematch. it's a rematch in the making for like three years now. Okay, it's a rematch. They got... Um, and then of course you got Derek Lewis, the beast yep. re- represent H town and North side. I liked it. Um, I, I can't remember which fight it was. He knocked somebody out and then he, he did the South side. Yeah. The little Kiki South side. Uh, he's always representing the H and then of course crew Bob mm-hmm. who used to hold mitts for me and said I had a, a hell of a right arm. I was there. It's true. He said I had a hell of a right arm, r- a, a right, uh, right cross. That's what he said. Yeah. I heard that's him. where the name baby Glock came from. Yeah. That's when he's like, damn, call you baby Glock. Pow! Anyway, uh, let's not talk about how I got tapped out by a female on Tuesday. <laughs> so the fighter companion, um, maybe you could walk me through after the show. Like basically, like look, man, you're gonna have to stream the show somehow. So at Frank's studio, can you can you order the fight via desktop computer? Mm-hmm. Okay. So yeah, he's got that. He's got a desktop, and uh, I'm sure we'll be able to stream to YouTube or Facebook and stuff like that. So. We're thinking about trying it. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, there's always events that we could always try here, too, if you want to try it back here in the future. Get some other people to come back. We get a table. Chill out. Because it's hours long, right? But you got, uh, yeah, Derek Lewis, Taito Avasa. You got Jared Cannonier versus Derek Brunson. Phenomenal fight. Uh, there's some other ones on the main card, but those three are the main ones. What time What time do you think the fights will be over? They're always over at least at midnight. Earliest. Shit. Yeah, it's like. Because. Well, uh-huh. Go, go ahead. No, I was gonna say like, Mighty Soul was like, "Oh, I want to join. I want to. I want to get on there." And um, so I'm thinking like, okay, if my sister watches the girls, we pick them up after the fight. I'm like, oh, midnight. No, that's that's gonna be too late. Well, it's, so the the prelims always start around 
seven, like the, the, the main card prelims and the early prelims. I mean, you're not going to start that early. It started like at three. So like the main card will start at nine and then it'll run till at least midnight. Usually it stops right around midnight. Shit. Yeah. So uh, when they do them, they do it for the prelims too, which is main card. Well, Eddie, bro, when they do like the Rogan ones, they tend to get there pretty early. They'll podcast for five hours. <laughs> yeah. Five hours, bro. <laughs> well, you got Brian Callen, Brian yeah. Brendan Schaub, Eddie Bravo, and Rogan. Like, yeah, you're going to go for five hours. Five hours. Yeah, man. But we'll see. Maybe we So should... maybe have some local comedians on with us or something. Yeah. We shall see. Um, the undercard, um, the only real exciting fight to me is Roxanne Matafari versus Casey O'Neill. So Israel is staying in an Airbnb around here. Word. Mm-hmm. Like around the corner. Mm. So if y'all see a, a Rolls Royce SUV around this bitch, it ain't Jay Prince. It ain't it ain't Tim Dillon? <laughs> he has that? He just loves Rolls Royces. He always talks about it. Oh, word. Okay. He's like, I'll never got to buy one, but you know, I might. Man, that guy's so funny. His rant recently about uh, all the attention Joe's getting from you know the spot. Oh, he's jealous of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, yeah. that guy's so fucking hilarious. Yeah. You started off RPT like that. It was very Tim Dillonish. I was like, damn, he's going in. Oh yeah, we could we could crank that up. You already know. Yeah, like you I was know, like, Phew. we can go in. Started feeling. Oh, what was I saying? I was like, Mexican Americans, y'all gonna be the last ones to get it. Yeah, y'all got to be the most closed minded, most controlled. Like, they got y'all, like, with the fucking carrot on a stick. Y'all refuse to listen to the other side of the argument. Y'all happy they gave y'all $30 million worth of crack pipes. Now that we're, like, in February, you know, kind of halfway through the first quarter of the year, do you feel like the conversation's finally switching up for the majority of the people? No. George Lopez still has way more influence. (laughs) Okay, that was quick. And there's not enough Latinos speaking out. There's not. Think about, especially, like, artists musicians, actors, who out there is calling out the BS? Who who's being like like neutral or transparent or just talking about freedoms and like how maybe this approach of locking us all down and masking us up forever may not be the best approach. Uh nobody. I mean I guess Gina Carano's Latina, I guess. Is she? Barely. Maybe. But I mean all the main people are gonna go along with the get along. That's primarily what people are doing. Like it's Evelyn too Goria, comfy and cushy. Evil Goria, she can't wait to 2024. She can get another check. George Lopez already got his pom poms out. He's ready to cheerlead for the Democratic Party. John Legend, he can't wait. He's gonna jump the minute they say go. Common, with, you know, it's those, crazy how great is how quiet they've all been. They, they ain't say shit about the 30 million dollars in crack pipes. Speaking of, let's go to George Lopez's Instagram and see. I know this ain't RPT, but we got to stir the pot from time to time. Hey, man. If you made it this far into the episode, you're welcome. Oh, of course they are. Diehards. Orale. He has a Mexican flag emoji. Shout out to the Discord again. Uh, who, who was blowing it up this morning? Of course, probably Giovanni. And then uh, we've had some other people that, let's see. So he <clears throat> Lopez posted a, um, a trailer for This Is Los Angeles, and they tagged NFL, NFL Network, NFL Game Day. <laughs> Because it's to promote Super Bowl? This is Los Angeles. Where people come from around the world to tell their stories on the biggest campus. This is the land of beaches. Of surf. Of sun-soaked optimism. Where we spread California dreams. With a side of California soul. And a little California love. California love. The NFL still owe me money. NFL, uh, NFL Network online. NFL owe me money. You said that when you were wearing the jersey the other day, and I thought you were joking. Yeah, no, they owe me money. Um, well, this is a cute little trailer. With the, somebody needs to do the green screen cutout, like they did Pelosi. Yeah, they need to have them. Like this is L.A. Respect. This is Los Angeles. Oh, and show funny. mandates. Show fucking homeless people, tents. Oh, the, uh, the train carts with all the Amazon fucking things out of yeah, it? Yeah, they they doing rail car heists. Um, show the kids having to walk under the freeway, on the street, around homeless people. Show the $30 million worth of free crack pipes. Uh, doo-doo on the sidewalk. People getting mugged at uh, patio restaurants trying to eat outside. Like, bitch, give me your watch. Um, show <laughs> the fucking uh, carjackings. <laughs> 
<laughs> Olympic officials admit concern over North Korea bo- uh, bobsled. So th- that reminds me of the picture of the ski, the big ski uh, ramp in the fucking nuclear wasteland. Did you see the picture? Yeah, yeah. It was comical. Dude. People, and, go ahead. Go, people thought it was fake. People were like, is that real? Like, no, that's real. What do y'all expect from a, a communist authoritarian dictatorship? You know what I'm saying? Where they got uh, organ harvesting, forced labor, genocide. They snatching people up off the street. And you know where that snow came from? No. They had to take water away from the Lao Beijing, the, the innocent people of China. They had to take their water to make this artificial snow so we could have the genocide squid games. No way. Yeah. That shit ain't real. It's not real snow. Orale, sabes que NFL, I'm ready for my close-up, a sneak peek behind the scenes of my collaboration with NFL Network. Those are the ones that owe me money, NFL Network. Mm. With my beautiful city as the backdrop and host of Super Bowl LVI, tune into NFL Game Day morning, Sunday, 9 a.m. for this full This Is L.A. feature. Hashtag chingon. It's funny because Roman numerals are definitely hard when they get past a certain number. Yep. I don't even know what L is. Is it 10? Fuck, I don't know. <laughs> No, 10 is X. Oh, you're right. Um, yeah, of course. They're not talking nothing about the fucking forever masking, elitism, fucking punk-ass Gavin and, and Garcetti. What did Garcetti say? Oh, I was holding my breath for the photo. Anyway. There's a, a AC Mata in the Discord posted this picture. It was, uh, let's see. Inside the Super Bowl LVI, we should probably just find out what number that is, Sunday menu at SoFi Stadium. So as rap heavyweights get set to grace the stage during NFL's traditional halftime show, the latest Fever Dreams podcast on the Daily Beast explores how far-right conspiracy theorists are warning about the satanic threat from the display. A satanic threat at a what display? The halftime show. Is it really? Does it look satanic? I have no idea. I haven't seen a single preview. I'm not going to lie. I don't really care about the halftime show typically. Especially this year, just not my not my jam. I'd rather have red hot chili peppers or something up there. <clears throat> yeah, so he was on here uh, promoting his Corpus Christi show. The oh, one, really? The one that they told us about. <laughs> Shout out to the patron that sent you that DM. That was funny. Yeah. Um, with stop the steal fanatic fanatics like Arizona wingnut Wendy Rogers hyper uh ventilating that the super bowl show exposes children to evil wicked satanic things her words there's a very real performance related satanic panic that's been brewing for a little while now in the u.s they said how Hmm. weird what a weird article to write about food menu the halftime show and then wendy rogers and arizona people think there's a satanic you know they're they're saying it's going to be a satanic uh ritual or some shit i don't know how true that is well wendy rogers do i mean i met her i have a photo um I like what she stands for. But yeah, she she says stuff sometimes like like she'll call my fucker a communist quick. Um hey, if it, hey, did Hentified get canceled? Who the fuck is that? You never heard of that show Hentified? It was on um Netflix. Yeah, it was on Netflix. But uh George Lopez posted that he had Felipe on and they were talking about how Hentified got canceled. We talked about trying to do um, the show, and then Gil's here because, you know, you give him a fucking hat, he don't go away. <laughs> <laughs> if Gabriel Iglesias wants to see what he's going to look like in 40 years, that would check, you know, check out, oh my God, hi. Before, it seemed like when they picked up a series that they would commit to the series and let the series be its, run its course. Yeah, like when, the, when it was like the, the first series, I remember like they give you mass advertisement on buses. Okay. Then the second season, you gotta pass off flyers. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do, though? Are you a card- comic book dude? I'm a co- I'm a movie guy. I don't know. I just love watching movies. And watch TV. That's why, because I'm terrified I'm gonna get in trouble doing some shit. <laughs> I did a show in Rocky Point, Puerto Peñasco, mm. and um, long story short, we never got paid. But um... <laughs> okay, so I guess that show got canceled. Mm. I never heard of it. <sighs> Maybe it was. Pushing the same old, same old. It was it was it like a Hispanic led yeah, show? Yeah, it's one of those. Yeah, it's gonna be okay. the same familiar faces mm. doing it the same familiar way. And I don't want to sound like a hater, <laughs> but obviously you and I haven't really watched it. I, no. Me and Marisol tried watching an episode or two, 
And it's kind of like, okay, this is tropish. This is the same old. She was speaking of shows. She was real quick. Last part. Yeah. Why does every show that gets funding on Netflix? Why does every show that portrays Hispanics, Latinos, Mexican Americans, Latinx, whatever the hell y'all call <laughs> us these days, why does every single Latin centric show have to be from the perspective of the SoCal lifestyle? The center of the Brown universe is not LA. No, not at all. Just because that's what Hollywood is and that's what the writers and that's where a lot of the actors, I don't know what, I don't know why, but it's always that perspective i love california no offense but we've had a couple decades from you know you know about you know blood in blood out american me you know well selena was the exception right yeah. that's the only one that had a little bit of text little texas in it but maybe that's why your show ain't ain't around no more mm. it's the same it's southern california they're in boil heights they trying to keep the re restaurant afloat and mijo's in the back washing dishes and you know i'm waiting for the comic relief and where's the plot who wrote this who's y'all's acting coach what's going on anyway we should turn into those people where's the wolf of wall street with the brown guy huh where's the investor at where's the real estate mogul huh where the fuck's yeah? Where's the 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 iron uh, fucking worker? Maybe different perspective, building shit. Maybe where's the uh, the miner that's getting gold out of the ground because you got a company that's mining for gold or silver or precious metals or the petroleum. Just saying, I don't know. Don't have to. I'm not gonna hurt my feelings if you don't make that movie. So I cut you off. You were saying? No, I was gonna say. Might have still mentioned to me y'all or maybe I don't know if y'all were, but y'all were watching something on Disney and this cartoon that was like very LGBT was like I guess it were series. I don't know if it was a cartoon or it was a few of them. Did you were you watching it? Yeah, we uh, we saw it on the menu, and of course you always notice like their agenda. Yeah, they're always it's always it's always Black History Month. Anytime you log on to Apple Podcasts or it's always, here are some Latino voices you may want. Here are some Latino voices we want to uplift. Right. It's always the same old back in the day thinking leftist, stereotypical, orale were victims. So you're on the Disney app. And of course, it's like out, which we had heard of. I think we had covered it on RPT. But it was like we started watching. We're like, let's see. What type of uh, indoctrination is going on on this Disney app? So basically, it starts off where it's like a, like a gay couple. It's two dudes. They got a puppy, and they show their picture frame of them, like, hugged up and shit. Like, it's like a, a, they're on vacation. It's animated, too, animated. And um, I guess the parents of one of the guys shows up. And he's like, oh, uh, they're here. I, like, hide the photo. And, the, and his dude is like, tell him. And tell them, you need to tell them. And he like leaves out the back door and he's having to like, you know, not be himself and still be closeted in front of his parents and all this stuff. And then after that, we just were like, okay, let's watch something else. But out of curiosity, we're like, huh. Especially once you see like the behind the scenes of what goes into the making, like how big of a, because these Disney and Pixar and all that, in essence, they become multinational tech companies. Right. They animate and they tell stories, but that's just a part of their product. Right. And obviously, you know, it's 2022 and they're very, uh, you know, Disney's very obviously in cahoots with the CCP and they're very leftist and American culture overall is very led Hollywood and everything's very progressive and liberal. Mm -hmm. Like you're not going to see a hardcore Christian animated short film on Disney that to them would be would be dangerous and terroristic and blasphemous yeah like if it was like christian values and america first and like a story of freedom and they're not gonna have that a story about rights and freedom and the founding fathers and how america's great no these these big platforms they rather push things like showtime right where they're like the white man is evil and we're all gonna roast the white man for an hour oh man what was i gonna pull up oh i've never have you heard of freedom tunes what? What in the QAnon? Dude, I've been meaning to watch this forever. He, um, Freedom Tunes. So Seamus, he's on uh, Tim Pool's podcast very regularly, and I've been meaning to watch this. I mean, I've been listening to Seamus for months and not watching any of his cartoons, but I really want to watch it. So let's watch it together for the first time. Uh, the newest one's from two days ago. It is uh, Joe Rogan apologizes. Let's see. Can I get this to play? What the fuck's going on here? God.
dude. You don't know your restart your computer. Fudge. Please restart your computer. Audio render. That's weird. I don't know what's going on. I just, just updated automatically, so I don't know why it's not playing. On my YouTube, someone left a comment. They said, Bobby said you're one of his favorite Asians. <laughs> I'm going to say that was Chris Stefano rhyming. Okay. Yeah, shout out to Bad Friends Podcast. They mentioned your boy. Uh, go to go to uh, my YouTube, CBTV. We want to set it up like uh, Brennan Shab, like Thick Boy Studios. So yep. uh, if you guys have any ideas for the name of my 20-minute YouTube special that's being edited as we speak, um, if you have a name for an idea of like our studio's umbrella. Uh, someone left a comment. They said, have all your albums. Love the parodies. But your original tracks are dope. This is the chingo that made me a fan. Okay, bet. Nice. Um, someone said, can you wake up Misfit, Soto, and other Hispanic rappers before it's too late? Some are gone. Nice. They're shouting out my water jug. <clears throat> Shout out Eric. As we're recording, we have a new patron who joined for the yearly membership. Thank you very much for joining. Justin. Justin, New, new member as we, as we broadcast. Uh, WAP Jr. left a comment on my YouTube. They said, love the show. Been a fan since the beginning. Don't ever back down from the radical left BS. Keep up the good fight. I wonder if uh, Lopez is in favor of boosting, triple vaccine, and masking. I mean, he's on the side of where he can't possibly speak out against it. Even if he was against it, he dare not say, you know what, guys? I think we should get our freedoms back. And <gasps> Racist word, right? You are, think, you, are you on YouTube right now? Yeah, I'm looking at these comments. What, what, what video was that on? Uh, I just went to the dashboard. Oh, okay, okay. I new, thought, yeah, new comments. Gotcha, never mind. Which comment are you talking about? No, no, no. I, just, I was wondering what video that was on, like what they were watching when they commented, but it's not a big deal. Because, <clears throat> you know, slowly they're starting to get more views. You know, podcasts are long, so unless you're way up there, it's hard to get into the tens of thousands of views on podcasts when you do an hour plus, you know. But no, yeah. it's cool. Um, Since you're on YouTube too, what? Oh, right. yeah, people no. complaining about the audio on there. They're like, hey, Rob, the volume is very low compared to the podcast. Oh. I don't know what's going on. Oh, yeah, is it me or are the podcasts on YouTube only half as loud as on Spotify? <laughs> Whistle. <laughs> all right, all right, I'll work on it here. Jesus. Um, I was going to say type in Freedom Tunes on your phone. See, there's like a minute video of... Uh, it's a YouTube? Yeah, just Freedom Tunes. Okay. The first video should be like Rogan Apologizes. Tunes. Since this update for some reason... Fudged up my video encoder. Joe, Joe Rogan apologize. Let's skip this ad. Um, uh, ad. In today's news, Joe Rogan continues to promote unhealthy, irresponsible behavior to his audience. This time by apologizing to a cancel mob. Extremely dangerous. Mac, experts agree that when you're facing a context of really well done, it looks good. Assembled by bad faith left wing activists, it's irresponsible and dangerous to validate them with an apology. What is the proper course of action? We've brought in the science himself to answer that question. I am truly grieved to hear that Joe Rogan That's is temple. continuing to spread medical misinformation. Apologizing is not a safe method for making these problems go away. The only responses recommended by the CDC are ignoring it or doubling down. Fascinating. Remember, people who say context doesn't matter won't care about the context of your apology. All they will see is you bending the knee and they will expect more. We need more responsible media pundits like the ones at CNN and MSNBS to continue to set a positive example by never apologizing for anything. We never will. Thank you for your service. You're right. I'm sorry. This is Joe, you're not getting it. The, the, we, Joe, this is extremely unhealthy. So, Joe, Joe, cut it out. Joe, stop, stop it. it. Stop it. Stop it. You have to stop, stop Joe. It. We're going to cut stop you off there. <laughs> Um, for the record, when I had the woke mob, the bots, I mean, people that, did, that didn't even know who I was, people who hadn't listened to my stuff in years, everybody was coming out the woodworks to uh, cancel, unfollow, uh, create a false narrative, call me all kind of names, try to pressure me to fold. I did not bend, fold, or apologize, not once. If you could find an inkling of an apology of me like, sorry, Rasa, it's not what I meant. Or you have to understand where I'm coming from. 
Not no. a wrinkle. Not, not even a, mother, a wrinkle or not crinkle. a motherfucking, not a motherfucking wrinkle of a semblance of an apology. So I stand by that, and I'm very proud of that. You know what I'm saying? Like everybody, even even Felipe, who we just had on George Lopez, Felipe, he you know, I don't think he said anything since, but he made a couple little comments. Mm-hmm. I ain't apologized not once. So I want y'all to remember that. Take a picture of that, write it down, put a thumbtack, uh, uh, put a pen in it. You know, whatever you got to do to memorize the shit. Chingo Bling did not motherfucking apologize for shit. I got called coconut, race trader, you want to be white, white Tino, uh, your privilege, you forgot where you came from, uh, we need to trade you for Shia LaBeouf. Um, <laughs> You're a, what is it? You're, you're a, you got paid by the Republicans. You're a sellout. All this type of shit. I didn't apologize not once. I know this is Chingo Chess, but I had to say that. Well, let's go out on this last little story here that I just had pop up. It's pretty new uh, from earlier today. Adele slammed for telling a gender non-neutral or a gender neutral rather award show. She loves being a woman. That's where we are. Pull That's where that we up. Are. Pull that up. That's where we are. Okay. This shout this, out Adele. This extreme radical postmodern Marxist, um, where they look at everything as uh through the lens of you know what I'm saying? They they look at everything as aha, uh-huh, this perpetuates differences along the lines of gender or class or race. It's very dangerous because you'll never be woke enough. Like, based on what you just said, Rob, Adele didn't say nothing wrong by saying I'm proud to be a woman. Woke. This is from the Sun. The one I read was from page six, but it's all over. It's like trending news right now. <laughs> Woke imbeciles. Pierce Morgan backs Adele as she slammed after winning gender neutral Brit award and saying, "I love being a woman." So now they'll they'll get mad at you if you're a female and you love being a woman. So now they're gonna accuse her of being a turf, a trans exclusionary radical feminist. Welcome to 2022. This is what happens when when Latino Hollywood, Hollywood and the powers that be, Disney, NFL, NBA, when they all go along with the get along, when these corporations get pressured by the woke mob, when Spotify gets their fucking chones in a bunch and they start getting all, oh, my God, we have Rogan on here. Like, that's what happens. Nobody ever pumps the brakes on these weirdos. Nobody ever calls them out. Like, listen up, Lane. We don't all have to play your little game. We're going to still continue to say there's only two motherfucking genders. That's hilarious. Fucking lames. Uh, Call me what you want. I will not apologize. Shout out to Adele, too. You know, she when she was a, a thickums, you know, she was always cute. She had a cute face. You know, she had a great voice, obviously. And then she got into, like, super shape. Now she's a little baddie. A little British baddie or English, whatever she is. Mm-hmm. Same shit. Whatever. Same, same. Same thing. Same area. Same thing. Same, same, same uh, accent. Well, all they're going to do is call Pierce Morgan racist. There, boom, that solves that. Yeah, for sliding with her. So, yeah, that solves that. They'll pull up some some old quote out of context. You're never going to win. We all lose when it comes to this woke mob shit. Yep. And, and why you think so many other um, Latino rappers who voted the way I voted, they're not going to say nothing. A lot of these comedians, a lot of people voted the way I voted. But some of them are like, let me shut the fuck up because... Trump is so polarizing and a Republican Party so polarizing and the woke mob will stop at nothing. Bro, they done posted my address on Twitter before, my home address. Um, what's that called? Doxing. doxing. They'll dox you. They'll intimidate you to shut you up. And last time I checked, we're on episode number 131, season 11 of Red Pill Tamales for all you suckers. Go subscribe to that feed if you haven't already. That's right. Patreon.com forward slash Red Piltamales is how you can directly support the show. As y'all notice, we don't have a bunch of commercials and sponsors and ads every two minutes. You don't, you don't got to fast forward for eight minutes just to get to us talking. Uh, yet. Yet. So support yet. directly or we will. Or if not, if not, I'm going to have to go do this DC comic movie, probably take a pay cut just to get some goddamn exposure. And show you motherfuckers I ain't fell off. You'll be the next uh, Kumail. What did, what did he do? He was in the Eternals Marvel movie, Kumail Nanjiani, stand-up comedian. He got super jacked, the Indian guy. Mm. I think uh, I think they were talking. I think Rogan and Akash were talking about him on uh, Jerry. Really? Yeah. Oh, I got to finish the Akash episode. Yeah, just because he got super jacked, and I don't think he does stand-up anymore. He just focuses on the movies, on the, the Marvel. Trying he to- must have not been that good at stand-up. I never saw him do stand-up. Um, I mean, I heard of him a long time ago because he was friends with like Pete Holmes and a lot of the uh, alt comedy scene people that would do shows at you know 
I guess alt venues. I don't know. I've never heard of stand up though. Yeah, I'm not into the alt style. Yeah, a little ironic kind of weird stuff on ironic shit. I don't know. Yeah, it's not my it's deal. It's basically um, an excuse for not being funny. <laughs> And to all the Latino comedians that are threatened by me, don't worry about me. I'm just a rapper. So don't worry about me. That's fine. I'm going to cut that. That's, that's the clip. Yeah. Don't worry about me. Don't, don't worry about me. I'm just a pod. I just got a little podcast about politics and I'm just a rapper. You do not have to be concerned about me. I'm not going to eat your lunch. I'm like the CCP. You don't need to worry about me. China's going to eat our lunch. And remember, all wars are economic. So any rapper that thinks we're not battling, the battle has already begun. Sun Tzu, what is it? Sun Tzu? Sun Tzu. No, I'm talking about? No, I'm talking, a lot of people don't know what you're talking about. You know they saying? need put, to. Put a pregnant pause on it then. You know what I'm saying? Art of War. Actually, go ahead and get Art of War and War of Art. Get both of those books. Man, dude. I gave away my copy of War of Art. I should always keep a copy of The War of Art. Yep. <laughs> Have you read? You read? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Really great. And it's super short. Like You need to read it periodically. Like That should be like a yes. quarterly kind of thing. You're absolutely right especially when it comes to this weight loss challenge that we're doing in the discord with the patrons, members of the Thea, is um, the resistance. Mm -hmm. The resistance is a thing that we all face when we're going to take an endeavor, like sign up for jujitsu or, or hire the trainer or, or getting up earlier, getting up earlier or holding yourself accountable, or picking a meal plan, or drinking more water, drinking more water, or, or signing up for the marathon, whatever, whatever it is in life you're going to attempt to do. When you start having that doubt and that feeling of like, I'm an imposter, I don't deserve this. Who do I think I am having a six pack? You know, people are going to think I'm, I th I'm, I'm, I'm full of myself. Um, all those doubts come from this thing called the resistance. Some people call it the devil. Some people call it that little lame bitch inside of you that wants to stay comfortable. And um, get familiar with that concept because we all have it. Anytime we're trying to like change our lives for the better it's almost like that hating ass homeboy, right? The one that's like, oh, man, you think you're all bad fool? Oh, what do you think? Oh, you oh, you want to get skinny? Oh, you over here trying to learn how to choke people? Oh, look, look, look at you. Who do you think? Oh, you want to do comedy now? Oh, look at this guy. Oh, podcast? Pff. Dude, you think you're going to be as big as Rogan? Pff. Everybody just had a face pop up in their head because they've all had that person around them at some point. And we all have that internal dialogue. Too. Sure. Uh, yeah, man, this was a great episode. Also, next week, I'm going to pull up. Did you watch by chance about a week ago? Somebody had posted this video of where, um, I think slow, what was it? Fuck. It was like chopped up cumbia m music where it came from. Did you remember seeing this in the discord? <clears throat> um, it was like a little mini doc of like where it originated. Like who was, who was credited with having created like chopped slow, and screwed. Like slowed up cumbia. Yeah, chopped yeah. and screwed kind of cumbias. And it was like. Monterrey and then Houston and people were saying no it's Houston first and it was a really interesting I mean I can only watch like five minutes because after a while it was just like it's not my style I, got, I shit. gotta find that link yeah it was Toy Selector in there I don't I don't think I, wa I didn't watch that much okay, okay but anyway good shit man good luck tomorrow on the weigh-ins and uh, we got one more week to go yeah it's really time to crank up the heat because um I'm no I'm not gonna weigh myself right now but we'll see we all wish me luck for tomorrow's weigh-in because after that it's just one week left that's it Thank you guys for tuning in. Spread the word. Be a force multiplier. Action, action, action. If you like it, tell a friend. Say, hey, man, Chingo's not crazy. He's got, he's got a non-political show, too. Signal, not noise. Signal, not noise. Y'all think he's over there being a QAnon. But guess what? When we fast forward a couple years, we'll be able to see who was brave enough to speak up, who was trying to bring up these issues to others, and who was fucking being a little cog in the wheel and shit being a damn tool to Hollywood. Se la lavan. Peace.